This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 540, recorded on March 22nd, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. I just didn't know what, what to say about you. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't say anything. Here I am sitting in scenic, uh, exotic Fort Lee. Only about two miles from here. If I look through the arch of the bridge, I can see the building that you're in. It's very windy out today. Yes, it is. Also joining us from Boston, Massachusetts, Rich Condon. There you go, ah. the itinerant virologist. Hello. Hello, Rich. Wow. Where it is uh, 39 degrees uh, with sort of slop coming out of the sky. Sorry. So you're in eastern Massachusetts. Uh, right? East, yeah. Far, well, far eastern. Boston. I'm in Boston. Yeah, it's on the water. It's got to be east, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Boston. I'm in, actually, I'm in Newton Highlands. So I'm in. Uh, oh. Western outskirts of the town. Close enough. Well, and also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And yeah, Newton. Newton's pretty much Boston. I think so. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's I definitely that Eastern way. Massachusetts. You can't get any more east than that unless you're on the Cape. Right. And joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just spent, for, for those of you... We had some listening, tech issues. We had tech beginning. issues. And as we've been talking for 20 minutes trying to hook up, which usually doesn't happen. Usually Dixon is here, and that makes everything easy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that fourth Skype computer doesn't get used very much, and so... No, it doesn't. The uh, addresses are not stored on it. That's right. We did solve one issue about my microphone, so I'm fine. I'm happy yes, with that. Yes, Dixon's headset was not working, and it turned out that the wires were not plugged in. Exactly. Oh, it's that'll do it. It's every usually time. the Always, simplest solution. See, exactly. Or Occam's razor rules. I once went to a colleague's office. She said, "My internet's not working," and I just looked behind, and of course, the <laughs> wire was out. And she said, "How did you know how to do that?" I said, well, "It's usually the simplest thing." <laughs> And um, before we go on, I wanted to ask everyone, if you like this show, consider supporting us. Since you're here now, and I know you leave at the end before I say this, <laughs> supporting us financially, you go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Uh, we, we, there are several ways you can help us, like Patreon or PayPal, where you give a dollar a month. We'd really appreciate it. All right, we have a bunch of follow-up from last week. Now, the first one, I had... I had um, the previous week from last week mentioned the Paul has measles in German, and then last week, uh, some Peter on Twitter uh, had said, um, uh, "Let me think before I uh, spread this news about this book." And of course, I criticized him last time. So he wrote on Twitter, how you misread my motivation. You didn't read the Swedish link before criticizing this tweet on the air. I follow you. I'm often able to interpret your tweets constructively while you don't follow me and misunderstood this maliciously sad face. Oof. Um, yes, I didn't misinterpret maliciously. And so he sent a link, um, which is in Swedish, but you can get an English version. And it's all about health stuff. It's the Public Health Agency of Sweden. And I, I dug around a little. And first of all, did you know vaccination in Sweden is voluntary? I didn't know that. Nevertheless, the sign-up rates for the ch child vaccination program has been high for many years. Right. And uh, in only over 98% of children born in 2012 had been given at least three vaccine doses against diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, polio, and haemophilus influenza. So they get pretty good uptake with a, v a voluntary system. So I think probably Peter was just being, you know, maybe funny or... Whatever, but he, he, I shouldn't have misinterpreted it maliciously. But that, that often happens on Twitter if you don't follow someone and all of a sudden you see a tweet, um, you, you say this person's being malicious. So I'm sorry about that. It often happens. And um, also on Twitter, it, hip to help 
said, no, you can't graft any two plants together randomly. <laughs> oh, I can, but they won't grow. <laughs> they, won't, <right. laughs> they won't be successful. I had no idea. I had no idea. Graft may be pervasive these days, but it doesn't go there. <laughs> exactly. So I wonder what determines yeah, exactly. what will grow, right? Because right. when we spoke with um, Folimonova, what's her first name? Uh, she was at TWIV at ASV last year. Oh, it, um, yeah. Anyway, she said they do a lot of grafting for their work. So obviously, it's probably the same right. the same species or whatever. But I'd be curious to know. Or related. Like what, I, what is yeah, it? That, you can, what's the limit? You can graft yeah. different fruits onto a rootstock, but I've, I haven't heard of anybody grafting like apple onto oak or I, I don't know what the limits are. Yeah. Svetlana. Yeah, Svetlana Folimonova. All right. Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Oh, wait. I have a search image up. Oh, Alexi writes, <laughs> Dear Twiv hosts, I'm writing to you for the first time, although I've been listening for five or six years. I used to work as a virology molecular biology lab researcher studying in different years plant viruses, HIV, and microRNAs. Several years ago, I quit lab research to do private teaching and tutoring, and I'm enjoying it so far. However, I keep myself up to date with literature in several fields of interest. Your Twix podcasts are in, an invaluable source of information for me. The nanovirus paper by Sikar et al., TWIB 539, is so interesting, and the problem of replication of multi-component, multipartite viruses is very fascinating. Small terminological comment. Symplasmic pathway means transport through plasmodesmata, unique and fascinating specialized channels connecting the cytoplasm of neighboring plant cells. And he sends a link to a recent review. Mm. Apoplasmic pathway corresponds to transport through intercellular space along cell walls of plant cells. Mm. Nanovirus is a phloem limited, parentheses phloem restricted, virus. So it can be found only or predominantly in three cell types that form phloem, sieve elements, companion cells, and phloem parenchyma. I don't think that all eight particles have to be present in the same individual insect vector. They can be delivered in different combinations by several individual insects, as each plant in nature would be expected to be attacked by more than one individual insect. I'll just stop there because I think that's something that we didn't really contemplate, right. but it does make sense. Yeah. In any case, all eight segments have to be delivered into the same plant, and they are delivered by aphids to essentially the same cell because aphids take sap from the sieve elements of the phloem, which are fused together and connected through enlarged plasma desmata of the sieve plate into one functional unit, sieve tube. However, sieve elements lack nuclei, ribosomes, and some other organelles, and while being live cells, entirely depend on companion cells for the supply of metabolites. Obviously, nanovirus cannot replicate in sieve elements. To replicate, viral single-stranded single DNA has to be delivered from sieve elements through plasma desmata to companion cells or phloem parenchyma cells. And it is this delivery that should represent a bottleneck, or one of them, for nanovirus. Mm. Indeed, if DNA segment, if a DNA segment of only one type is present per cell, the cells would need to exchange viral mRNAs or viral proteins essential for replication. For example, MREP, the initiator of replication, movement protein, cell cycle resetting protein, and the nuclear shuttle protein. Also, transport of genomic single-strand DNA and coat protein to the site of assembly needs to occur. All these exchange events between cells where replication, transcription, and translation of separate DNA components occur are possible through plasmodesmata, considering the fact that many viral movement proteins are able to modify plasmodesmata, increasing their size exclusion limit. Okay, I'm going to pause there again because hmm. I think we were a little hazy on what the movement proteins do, and so at least it sounds like they increase the size exclusion limit, therefore opening things up. So right. that's helpful to know. Okay, back to his letter. Moreover, plasma desmata between companion cells and sieve elements already have increased size exclusion limits by default, compared, for example, to plasma desmata between mesophyll cells. So, if the nanovirus assembly occurs in sieve elements, DNA and coat protein would be able to move there. However, because of my ignorance, I do not know where exactly assembly of nanoviruses occurs. 
Yet, I would like the authors to show not only transport of the MREP protein between cells, but also transport of all other viral proteins. And I entirely agree with Vincent that the formation of infectious virions needs to be formally shown here. This may also require the precise site of assembly to be established and detected first. Otherwise, a very interesting paper. I used to work with plant viruses that have only three components, but here we have eight. So conceptually, this is certainly a much more difficult problem to tackle for both nanovirus and researchers. And he has a smiley face. (laughs) Please keep up your excellent work on science communication. I absolutely admire your work on virology education, from plant viruses to vaccination of humans to many other topics. It's plus four Celsius, minus five with wind chill, and light rain in Toronto. Good weather to stay inside and listen to TWIV. Best regards, Alexi. Hmm. Well, it sounds like plants are set up for this kind of thing. Distributed replication, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Hmm, I didn't know a lot of that. Hmm. Yeah, plants are majorly uh, complicated here. There's a lot yes, there. we don't know yes, about plants. Well, as we said, or I said last time, plants are just weird. <laughs> So uh, also someone on twi- on Twitter said, you know, e- we asked for infectious virus, but they said, you know, eLife doesn't ask for more experiments. Um, well, then don't publish it if you think the experiment's <laughs> needed. In this yeah. case, I think, and, you know, I was rereading the paper this week and they said, we demonstrate complementation, you know, among the segments. And I'm thinking, they didn't demonstrate any complementation at all. So... Um, and bio is the same. They typically don't want you to do more experiments, in which case you say reject with, you know, and encourage them to resubmit with the right experiments. So anyway. Well, I was thinking as I uh, listened to the episode last time that Dixon at one point had commented, at one point commented, what happens if you leave a segment out? Right. And I was thinking that uh, if they did these experiments with that control, Leave one or several. Well, what are you segments. measuring? What are you measuring? Infectivity. Well, n- <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, you <laughs> no. would expect if the replication assay that they've used is legitimate, that if you leave a segment out, that that signal would go away. Right. So, uh, as a, as as a a complement or an alternative to measuring infectious virus, you could at least do that control. You'd have to have the right segment, right? Well, yeah, I was thinking about that. You might have to have the right segment. Certainly the rep segment, yeah, you, yeah. if I understand the cycle correctly, should be required for replication of all of them. So that would do it. I don't know that leaving the – probably leaving the capsid segment out wouldn't do it necessarily because you might be able to replicate the other uh, uh, segments in the absence of the cap protein. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. All right. Anyway, neat story for sure. Thank you. That's very good, Alexi. Very yeah, yeah that's really helpful. nice. Very I, I, I just want to say though, I think we should still do plant virus papers because oh yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, we can between us and the listeners, we can sort it out. Yeah, yeah. right. Vincent, plant viruses cause more economic damage throughout the world and food shortages than anything else. Yeah, and more no, than I, insects. I, I don't doubt oh, well, the it, importance. You need insects to transmit these things, but uh, I'm going to tell you that. Rice blast, for instance, is a horrible disease. It's really that's a fungal disease. I'm sorry, but um, plant diseases in general, sure. uh, microbes are just horrible on crop plants. Yeah, we got that impression from the TWIV at ASV last year, for sure. Um, Alan, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Marcus writes, uh, and this was apparently in re- response to your post on your blog, but it's relevant to 20539. Story about chloroviruses luring hosts through long distance chemical signaling. <laughs> Neat story for sure. Also, also, though, as you suspect, at least one other virus out there has been shown to do it, too. And this report thus does not seem to be the first to document the ability of a virus component uh, to do this. For HIV, it was first shown that viral components shed from infected cells can attract target cells, and he sends a link to a report, <clears throat> and Kathy had a comment on this. Well, just that this is one where uh, the HIV GP120 is thought to be the attractant, but right. in a form that's shed from the infected cells, not as part of an intact virion, right. I guess. Um, David, uh, continuing with the Marcus's letter, David Soul's group also published a paper a little later documenting that the combination of NEF and TAT acts as the lower 
molecular mass T cell chemoattractant, again for HIV. And a few years later, Anna Aldovini's group showed that, again, TAT can act, act indirectly by triggering in immature dendritic cells the release of chemoattractants that recruit potential target cells. And provides another link. There's also an accompanying commentary by Mario Stevenson and another link. Um, and then we have a response from David. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, David, was he the first author on the paper? He was the C, the PI, David Dunning. Okay. PI. Right. Okay. I couldn't remember where he was. Um, who says, there is a fundamental difference between the HIV and chlorovirus stories. To my knowledge, the HIV-generated chemotaxis is due to the interaction of the virus with a cell. In the chlorovirus case, there is no cell required. The chemotactic agent is associated with the virion, and that's all you need to cause the behavior change of the paramecium. Needless to say, we're progressing, and we'll let you know if anything stunning emerges. Emerges. These viruses have given us several surprises over the years. Also, I want to mention that we just had our 29th annual Nebraska Virology Retreat this past weekend. In fact, folks from four states in the region attended. So next year will be our 30th, known as Fly Swat. <laughs> and we would like to invite the TWIV team. Let me know if you folks are interested. Hope all's well. Signs D3. Mm. <laughs> um, that so has ne- been taken. <laughs> Nebraska, Nebraska in March is the invitation. <laughs> hey, we just went to Iowa in February yeah, or March. True. That's true. What the heck? Yeah. I'll go anywhere, anytime. I don't care. You'll, if you go there now, you'd have to swim. As long, as, long yeah. as I don't have to fill sandbags, I'd be up for it, yeah. <laughs> so I went to one of these uh, years ago, uh, one of these virology retreats, and it was very nice. So we should go cool. um, again. Yeah, I, w- I went to, I think they have a retreat, and they also have a, Another kind of a symposium or something, and I went to the symposium one. So maybe we, maybe that's what I'm thinking of the uh, yeah, the one where the the neighboring states come to. The, I think so. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, the, yeah, because there were people from Omaha and yeah, so forth. Yeah. 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 So D three is interesting. David D Dunn again, and that reminds me, Roland R Rookert used to call himself R cubed. <laughs> if you have uh, the right name, you could be R two D two, right? <laughs> Right. You'd need four four names. And Dixon Donald de Pommier, right? That's right. That's right. You're D cubed also. Do you want to be D3 or D cubed? D cubed is better. There's a guard downstairs every morning. I come in, then she's there. She says, D cubed. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that's very good. I like that. I like that. Yeah, uh, it's fun. It's fun. Not all of us can do that. All right, uh, Rich, you have some follow-up, right? Yeah, so I wasn't on last time, uh, but I listened to the episode and talked to you the whole time. (laughs) Uh, And I had uh, some thoughts on uh, some of the stuff that went by. The uh, chlorella infection. Okay, so uh, the chlorella is a blue-green algae that sits, that's inside the paramecium, right? Mm -hmm. And the chlorella virus attracts the paramecium and the virus sticks on the outside of the paramecium but can't infect the chlorella and the whole mess gets eaten by a copepod which then digests the chlorella chlorella and then you guys talked about it being pooped out into the uh, water where the virus then infects the blue green algae and I'm thinking I'm betting the infection happens in the gut of the copepod so that makes that would make sense to me to to ingest the whole uh, mess, paramecium, blue green algae, attached virus, and basically burst the paramecium in the copepod gut, and there you'll have a fairly high concentration of virus that was sticking to the paramecium. Point. And it would be it would be contained in the gut, so you would right. it, it wouldn't uh, diffuse out immediately. Right to the so water de- column. Yeah. So D cubed, you guys need to do some sort of. <laughs> you need to dissect uh, some copepod. <laughs> so, Rich, I'm looking at I'm looking at the paper. They have a figure s- summarizing this. So they have the copepod passes fecal pellets with intact zuccarelli into the water in the proximity of chloroviruses that were attracted to the cilia D. The chloroviruses then encounter zuccarelli, which leads to virus replication in the water column. So they have it uh, outside, happening outside the copod. Yeah, well, they're wrong. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. Uh, And then I was thinking about this idea of viruses attracting... um, uh, other critters, and I was thinking, well, we're attracted to viruses. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I don't know what the chemokine is. 
<laughs> in some, some other dimension. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Uh, I already talked about the multi-part genome and I was listening, you know, you guys struggle through all the plant biology uh, and the multipartite virus and everybody trying to figure this out. And I was thinking, this is really great. The, the informal nature of this podcast is a great example of how scientists work, Yeah, you know, discussing this stuff and trying to, trying to figure it out. So right. I think that's something you don't find everywhere. The only thing missing was a blackboard. Uh, right. Uh, and lastly, there was discussion of, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody and some people panning Bohemian Rhapsody. So my wife loves Bohemian Rhapsody and I've watched this film about four times. I understand where some of the complaints come from, but you know, relax. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's a great film and Brian May, who was the lead guitarist, actually both he and, um, Roger Taylor consulted for the film and, uh, they both liked it. Okay. He says, uh, Brian May says, it's a film which portrays the truth in a fairly gritty and honest, but also entertaining way. So I recommend the film. Dig it. Well, I had a friend say it was just like being at a Queen concert. So, mm -hmm. Dixon, can you take uh, the last one, please? Sure. Anthony writes, lady with a cannon. I guess Dr. Condon already got in touch. But in Austin, there was a woman who stopped the moving of estate records by firing a <laughs> cannon. If memory serves me correctly, she meant to hit the people working for Sam Houston, but missed. The sound of the cannon fire served as an alarm, and the records and state capital remained in Austin. <clears throat> um, did something similar really happen in Iowa? In Austin, there is a statue outside of the state house commemorating the event. Um, I got the story mixed up because I think we were all driving in the car and, uh -huh. and Rich Listening was telling me, no, no, God. Rich was talking about the, uh, the Houston, right, Rich? Yeah. I was talking about the Austin story. There is indeed a statue of Austin in Austin of, uh, Angelina, uh, Eberly firing off a cannon to chase away the, uh, Raiders from Houston, Texas, who were trying to come to Austin to move the archives from there to Houston and establish the Capitol there. And she raised the alarm and did minor damage to the records building. Okay. I I've always wondered what a loaded cannon was doing sitting out on the street there. I assume she just went <laughs> it's down. Texas. And it's Texas. Yeah, oh, it's Texas. This was <laughs> shortly after Santa Ana was vanquished. So, they were prepared for a, re a retrial. <laughs> so I got mixed up because we were driving towards the cap, the former Capitol building, and, the old Capitol yeah, of Iowa, and and Rich was telling this story. So I I transposed the two. It's my my yeah. Bad. Wendy Wendy yeah, was and, talking. Wendy was talking about the Capitol, right, right? Right. And I I almost corrected it last week, but then I was a little unsure of myself. But uh, yeah, the the story about the old Iowa Capitol is simply that they moved the Capitol to Des Moines and the building that got left behind became the first University of Iowa building. Mm -hmm. Midwesterners right. are much more sensible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Waste not, what not. Right. We have a snippet for you. Published in M-Sphere, genotypic and phenotypic diversity of herpes simplex virus 2 within the infected neonatal population. This comes from Morias Barra, who hosted us, Alan, do you remember? And Rich at uh, Penn State a number of years yes. ago? Yeah, that yes. was a, that was a really fun conference. I enjoyed that. Whiter Teeth, Fresh Breath. That's the name of the yes. TWIV. <laughs> Whiter Reefs, Fresh Breath. Wasn't Whiter it? Reefs, yes. Yeah. You should know. You made it up. Yeah, <laughs> that was the coral bleaching. and Yeah. Lisa Akhtar, Bowen, Renner, Pandley, De La Fera, Kimberlin, Pritchard. Then we have Richard Whitley and Matthew Weitzman. And Marias, so this comes from Children's Hospital, Philadelphia, Penn State University, University of Alabama, and the University of Pennsylvania. All about herpes simplex virus type 2, which um, infects about 10,000 neonates every year. And um, this is, um, they're typically infected when they're born by maternal shedding, genital shedding of herpes viruses. And these mothers are typically not aware of their infection. And uh, this uh, genital HSV-1 is right, going up. If, if they were aware, 
you could avoid this with a C-section, presumably. That's right. Someone wrote that in the show notes. Right. I'm be- I'm willing to bet it's Condit. It's me. Because it's not yeah. green. If it were mm-hmm. Kathy, oh, Kathy would be purple. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mine would be red. Yeah. And Rich and I just use the default font color. Well, I come through in green now and then, you know. Uh, I read an invisible. Ink. So this is a ser- This can be a serious infection. Some of them only get superficial infection, um, but half of them get invasive systemic infections, which can involve the central nervous system, and this can be very serious and even lo- lead to death. And you know, for that, you treat the kids with acyclovir. Um, but even though it can reduce the mortality, the kids can have permanent neurodevelopmental deficits as a consequence of this. So why do some kids get these, you know, invasive infections versus the superficial ones? Um, And it's because it's half and half, it's probably not some obscure host genetic thing. Yeah. And so, you know, we know that toll-like receptor 3 is involved in kids who have serious uh, brain infections with herpes simplex viruses. That's work from a number of labs. Right. I think we have talked about it. Um, but that no one's really looked at the virus. That's not, that's not prevalent enough to explain it. No, it's, it's quite rare. Yeah, it's quite rare. So what about the virus? But no one's really looked. Uh, and in fact, people have always assumed that herpes simplex viruses are pretty genetically stable, right? And more recently, that's been questioned by a variety of... Uh, approaches, but it's not easy because <laughs> these uh, this, this genome is big, 150 KB, and, and if, well, the one thing everyone says, they always complain if you're a herpes virologist, the high GC content, <laughs> about 70%, a lot of repeats in the genome. And, they, and so if you remember your DNA biology, A's and T's form two bonds between them, and G's and C's form three, and if you have 70% of your genome is G's and C's, it's stuck, the two strands of DNA are stuck together a lot more thoroughly, yeah. and it makes it a huge pain to work with. I heard that for 30 years from Saul Silverstein. Yep. Well, we can't do that because of the high GC content. That's like complaining about the weather, you know? Yes. <laughs> Deal with it, you know? <laughs> so the other thing of she's uh, the, the author say is that there's not a lot of low passage neonatal isolates uh, that have been, you know, annotated properly. So that's what they're attempting to do here. In this, they say the first ever application of comparative pathogen genomics to neonatal herpes simplex virus disease. And, and the, just the to, reason, uh, the reason yeah. that the low passage is important is even though this is a DNA virus, and you might think, oh, it, it's not going to change very much. We're going to find out that. That's maybe an oversimplification. And so if you start with very low passage right from the patient, as close as you can get, then you're going to actually be looking at the virus itself and not something that's arisen while it got passed in cell culture. Right. right. So, uh, so the, the reason for the low, I'm sure we're going to discuss that they, have, they do have a small se- sample set in this paper. It's not some huge clinical trial. Um, but bear in mind that these are kids that are born – and be, become very sick and you don't want to be sticking them and taking a lot of samples. And so these samples tend to be rare. Yeah. So just parenthetically, I was in the, I took a tour of the hospital clinical micro lab this week here. I'd never been in the place. Right. And they said they never ever try to culture viruses anymore. They said they used to do it all the time. And, you know, it was really hard because you, you're never sure what cells to use, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, they just do PCR, you know, and yeah. and that's it. So they don't have any samples. And then, of course, if they have a sample, they throw it away after seven days. So you need to do something special to retain uh, specimens. Um, so this, yeah, in this study, they had samples from 10 HSV2-infected neonates that had been done. Uh, by an NIH study between 1981 and 2008. And half of these kids had invasive CNS disease. Some of them had disseminated disease or or superficial disease. And the key here, they had information, clinical information about each patient, right? Not just the initial, but long-term follow-ups, right? So that's Mm -hmm. really good. And de-identified, of course. Yes. But they knew the sex and the race, and they knew how old the child was when the disease uh, Mm -hmm. came about, how old they were in gestational weeks 
uh, when they were born, and so forth. So yeah. And the samples were taken before a cyclovir was started, and then each isolate was cultured only once for diagnosis. And then they did some other expansions in this study here. So this is low passage, which is what you would like to have. And they took these 10 and they did a number of cell culture phenotypic studies. And then they did some sequencing. And the the first thing is they just put them in cell cultures and they say, how, how do they grow? And they look at plaque size first. And they differ. The plaque size were different <laughs> among the 10. And they say six of the 10 were larger than the other four. Um, so they say right away, this must be different because right. the plaque sizes are different. I, I wanted to point out, too, they used Vero cells as the plaque assay type, and that's because they lack an interferon response. So I think that would minimize the impact of the immune pressure mm. on uh, doing these these experiments. So then they say, what's going on? Why is the plaque size different? And I love this. Here's a sentence I'm going to read because it's really nice. Plaque formation is a complex endpoint that involves the ability of virus to enter the cell, replicate, produce viral proteins, assemble new virus particles, and then spread to adjacent cells. It's beautiful. So they say, what's going on? Let's look at the different stages and try and explain the plaque size. So they looked at cell entry. No difference. Um that relates to plaque size. Um, DNA replication, genome copy number, no differences uh, related to plaque size. Protein production, no differences with respect to plaque size. So none of that seems to correlate with making a larger plaque. But when they looked at spread from cell to cell, uh, then they could see that the viruses that formed larger plaques had better cell-to-cell spread, and that makes a bigger plaque. There's no obvious correlation, by the way, between the plaque size and the pathogenesis. No, no, there isn't. You know, one thing I would say, which wasn't included in that summary of what makes a plaque big or small, it can be what's in the overlay, too. You know, hmm. the, I was thinking the same thing, yeah. Because that, yeah, a virus could differ, even though it's a herpes simplex type 2 and you usually lose, use whatever overlay, it could change. Uh, so that could be it. So, so, Vincent, did they mix the small plaque size virus with the large plaque size virus and infect the same culture plate with both together to see whether you got big and small plaques? No, they didn't do that. But Dixon, what, what if they did that and they got all big plaques? What would you conclude? It's got to be something to do with the cells, not the virus. I don't know. I was thinking of complementation, but yeah. well, I was also going to ask whether they did a DNA sequence on each one to make sure that they were yeah, identical. They, that's next. Yeah, we're getting to that. Okay, fine. So they they sequenced the complete genome of all ten isolates. Right. All right. And they swore a lot when they were doing it. I imagine. I'm sure, because Saul used <laughs> to swear the all the time. <laughs> GC content. Yeah. <laughs> And if you take the sequences and you compare them with known sequences of non-neonatal isolates, there's no p particular segregation of these neonatal isolates. They all fit in, you know, kind of throughout the, the whole phylogenetic tree. Weird. Yeah, so there's nothing special about these in terms of overall sequence. So uh, then what... I mean, the, the goal here is to say, can we find any kind of change that would correlate with, you know, CNS disease or something like that? And so they found no protein deletions or truncations, but they did find nucleotide differences, 784 differences and 71 genes leading to 342 non-synonymous amino acid differences in 65 proteins spread throughout the genome. And this diversity is pretty much similar to a comparable set of 10 adult isolates of the same virus. So there's nothing unusual there. So they have a lot of diversity spread throughout the genome, but not particularly different than uh, other non-neonatal isolates. All right, so then they say, what about minor variants in these populations? Is there anything interesting? So they looked at variants in the genome below 50%, above 2%. 
and they could find these readily. They had 1,800 and so viral variants, minor variants distributed all across the genome. Uh, nearly every viral protein had such minor minor variants. A couple of proteins did not. Um, but again, there's a they say there's a quite a broad range of change that could contribute over time, right? That could be selected out uh, in in particular niches. All right, so are any of them associated with CNS disease? So they say a few of them are shared by CS, a few of the changes, uh, amino acid changes are shared by uh, isolates from the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, and those form the largest plaques. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but um, as they say, the number's too small to really make yeah. any good correlation with any of these. They need more isolates. 10 is just not enough. And um, so we don't know if any of these have have any role in CNS disease or they're simply associated with it. Um, but this study is an important um, kind of marker to put out there and say, look, this can be done. For sure, yeah. And when you do it, you find stuff that you may not have expected, like this diversity. Um, and as you, as we said at the beginning, there's this, there's been this long assumption that well, DNA viruses don't vary much the way RNA viruses do. And with herpes, there was some early evidence from more primitive analyses that there wasn't much variation. But now we see with the sequencing technology that's come online, we can sequence this stuff and um, get the result that there is actually a lot of variation going on, mm -hmm. and that some of it may be relevant. So I think this points in a direction that people weren't really moving and they need to. Did they there, talk about within individual uh, variants from someone in this study? I, I think they referred to one in the literature, but I was thinking oh, that yeah. they had data in this paper that there was some within individual variation, but I might have that wrong. Oh, oh yeah. No, that was part of, that was part of the thing. Yeah, okay. Individuals uh, have... Uh, variation in viruses within them, and that and that's uh, that's as important a, a, a finding as anything else. So these are right. not uh, homogeneous um, uh, cultures of a uh, of virus. Mm -hmm. You find you find uh, variants uh, in an individual patient. That to me was as surprising as anything else. You know, the DNA genomes in the laboratory because of r r uh, proofreading during replication are more stable than RNA genome. So if you, you know, clone a virus and passage it over a long period of time, if you're dealing with an RNA virus, you accumulate a lot of variants and a DNA virus, you don't, but out in, out in nature, there's not a lot of cloning going on. Okay. So I think, uh, over time you can, and have, it's not swarms in the same sense of uh, RNA viruses, but certainly heterogeneous uh, populations of viruses. Um, uh, so uh, that's an important thing to, uh, to keep in mind that this that this demonstrates. Uh, they also say in their in, in their conclusions, they say we found these ten neonatal HSV two isolates exhibited diverse growth characteristics in culture with larger plaque forming isolates observed more often in intra in infants with CNS disease than those with uh, the superficial disease. So they're saying that there is a bias towards the larger plaque isolates showing up in CNS uh, uh, disease. Now, um, I think that's debatable when you look at their data. It depends on yeah. where you draw your cutoff as to what's a large and what's a small plaque. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in their yeah. figure, they've made a, I don't know that it's an arbitrary cutoff, but they've made a cutoff um, so that, uh, I mean, they're clearly large plaque isolates associated with a superficial disease. Likewise, there's small plaque isolates associated with disseminated or CNS uh, disease. Um, in, in, but they think that their analysis is that the majority of the guys in the superficial disease are small plaque. The majority of the guys in the uh, CNS disease are large plaque. That kind of depends on two of these, uh, what you call two of these guys that have an intermediate plaque size. Yeah. So and and also the the majority of those with superficial disease, there are three. 
Yeah. 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 With superficial. So, and it, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. T- two out of three. Ma- all right. That's really. No, they, they agree that the numbers are too small. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The numbers are too small. But the interesting thing is, is that the large plaques seem to be caused by better spread from cell yes. to cell. So that's kind of interesting in terms of CNS. Yeah. What's, what's interesting here is that you have these large and small plaque phenotypes, that these things arise, that this diversity arises even within a single host. And that the large plaque phenotype correlates with this easier cell-to-cell spread. So there's stuff going on here. You're getting consequential mutations happening easily in this DNA virus that was thought to be so stable. Vincent, just a question. We we did a whole show on plaque assay once, and I didn't think of even asking this question, but I will now. Because if you set up uh, 10 culture plates that you hope are absolutely the same, and you did everything you could to standardize everything, and you infected it with the same viral titer in each plate, what is the variation in plaque size between those 10 plates? Well, it's the same. You know, Within one plate, you're going to get a variation because some plaques have begun earlier than others, and it doesn't take much to make... So, you know, poliovirus, you get... If you do a 24-hour incubation, you get some tiny ones and you get some bigger ones, but that's going to be the same on all 10 of your plates. So how different were these plaques to call one large group and the other small group? What was the uh, the measurement? Right. The, the consistency of the size, if you look at um, figure one, you see that they're, uh, you know, CNS-12, they're consistently itty-bitty plaques. There's variation within them, but none of them are as big as the ones in, say, DIS-14. This is a, this paper's open access, by the way. Um so you can you can say even though there's variation within each plate they are definitely in different ranges. Yeah. So Dixon, uh, if you look at the graph, they have it in millimeters, uh, right. or so yeah. anywhere from less than 0.1 millimeter squared to more than three millimeters squared. So, yeah. And if if you look if you look at the images, there's there's uh there's no question. You know, the the three that they call really large plaque size guys are clearly different than the intermediates yes. are clearly different than the small guys. And experience dictates, Dixon, that if you uh, did, you know, 100 plates of the large plaque guy, you'd get essentially the same thing. Okay, there's not a lot of host. Right. The host isn't going to do much on this. How much variation with the – I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the paper, so I'm asking stupid questions here. But <clears throat> maybe I should save this for afterwards. No, that's uh, okay because the listeners aren't looking at the paper either. That's right. So, okay, 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 fine. We don't want so them on the, <laughs> the voice of the public here. <laughs> so uh, of the large plaque formers or the small plaque formers, what was the variation? Uh, what was this? You know, I mean, how many standard deviations do you go before you say it's a small one rather than a large one? Or were there's a, were, was there a, a okay, continuum so the, of size? So there's, you know, the small ones, one of them, uh, almost all, all of the points are 0.5 millimeters squared. Mm-hmm. Uh, one Almost of the large small. ones, okay. uh, all of them are 0.5 millimeters squared or smaller. Yeah. And then there's another one that has the largest plaques, and there's one that's probably about 0.3 millimeters squared all the way up to 3.7 millimeters squared, with the average being around 1.8 millimeters squared. So right. they're quite different. The bigger ones have a bigger spread. Right, yeah. right, as you said, and that's probably it. because with the small ones, they're even tinier ones you just can't see. <laughs> right. So does this suggest that there's only one difference between the big plackers and the small plackers that you could fo- focus in on eventually and say, aha, that's the one that's causing the difference? Well, as, as you know, I said there are hundreds of differences you did, but, in this protein coding. So, But you only get two variants. You'd, you'd have to first – make some recombinants, big recombinants, to see what part of the genome it's in. Then right, maybe you could right. narrow it down. You could do that, and I'm sure yep. somebody's going to do it. Right. Right? Could be an interesting, just actually, an interesting question. That's an interesting question. My first my first reaction would that it uh, would be that it would be uh, really complicated. On the other hand, mm-hmm. there are in numerous viruses known uh, single mutations that can affect plaque size dramatically. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. I mean, you, you just do a half-genome swap. Yeah, see yeah, where that's it goes. Right. That's right. That's and right. if it's and it, multiple ones, uh, and then it's harder, yeah. yeah. I assume that there's so much difference between the small plaque formers and the large plaque formers that you couldn't create a hybrid of one strand from one and one strand from the other to see what happens under those circumstances. It wouldn't hybridize fully, right? You make a recombinant. Okay, you take I mean, half the genome from a big plaque, the other half from yeah. a small plaque, and you do it in both directions. 
You understand what I'm saying, Dixon? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I that's the way. That's part. how you would do it. What if you, you find out which DNA tells you which half of the genome is doing it, and then sure. you split that half in half and. Narrow my it. guess. It, my guess is. Here's my bet: is that there are probably genes where you can mutate a single gene and get uh, an effect on spread. Sure. But there are probably several such genes. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Even many such genes, so that in the end, narrowing this down. Well, I suppose any given virus could uh, be just one of those genes. And so you could, by doing a sort of analysis we're talking about, uh, define a set of genes that, uh, that affected spread in this context. Mm-hmm. But this isn't just about the plaque size, right? It's about whether it causes severe disease in neonates. Exactly. So once you've located that one t- difference, that's huge, I think. Enormous. You've got yourself a handle on what causes the disease if you could work it out in vivo. Well, that's yeah. th- that's the big if, right? There, what would no you animal need? models for this? Well, one? maybe. That's, as I was reading this paper, I was thinking about animal models for for herpes virus, and they're, I mean, and they exist, but I don't know how you'd approach this in that. Right, and so they're then, really difficult. The animal yeah. models, and then yeah. the other question is how many neonates do you want but with a genome this size with so many changes you'd need a lot sure. i think no, no, I got it. and then still it's just an association right you still have to mm-hmm. and they took like the, the the study was over a period of like 28 years and they got 10 samples yeah wow now, i don't know if they were trying to take samples uh from everybody during the study but you know, one of the problems yeah. probably there's a problem in recruiting people to the study but there's also a problem in uh you know that's mm. uh not a real common uh problem so it's not uh, a common condition the kids are very sick um the initial problem of collecting the samples from the neonate before treatment you know you've got this tiny very sick baby and you're going to now do a spinal tap um you know, and, the, and then you're going to follow up how often and how long are people going to stick with this? Yeah, and that's tough. It's, so tough. It's, it's not too surprising that they only had 10 of them. Um, and yeah, this is a rare condition. Ultimately, of course, what you're trying to get to is a better biological understanding of this process so that we can intervene. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know, it's not, it's not completely obvious how you would use this information for that, but this is certainly. Uh, something that you want to know. If it's a specific well, one, variant of the virus, then we want to be focused on that and maybe find ways to target that. One thing, one thing I thought of is that if you know, in the in a really simplistic idea, if you can identify different, if you like strains of the virus that are more or less prone to uh, causing disease, uh, then you might prepare. If you knew the mother had mm-hmm, one or exactly. another strain, you might prepare yep. differently. Uh, uh, during the birth. Sure. Okay? Of course, if exactly. you knew the mother had exactly. one or another strain of a herpes virus, then you would perform a cesarean section and anyway, get yeah. try to avoid it. this problem. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. We need to know anyway. We may you not, need to know. We may not know why we need to know right now, but we need to know. Yes. <laughs> by, <laughs> the way, by the way, and, by and the also way, is this our... isn't just this isn't just about neonatal herpes. This is about herpes viruses in general and how much they vary, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and how to approach mm-hmm. that and the consequences of that variation. So there's a, there's a lot in here. It's a juicy paper. There was one thing I uh, noticed also in the introduction that I don't think we've said yet. Maybe we have, but that. These newly acquired or primary HSV infections are occurring prior to the development of maternal antibodies. So right. it's as I say, they say it suggests a window of opportunity where this viral genetic variation to the progression of inv- invasive infection hmm. might be greater in neonates than in adults. Right. Right. So the selective pressure on the virus is less, has right. a better opportunity to uh, play with variation. Right. This so we were there in 2016 at Penn State, and Myra was just talking about this study, getting it going. Yes, mm-hmm. and now it's just been published. So it's it's hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, we have a paper for you published in Science, and the name of this is "Parallel Adaptation of Rabbit Populations to Myxoma Virus." And I am going to hand it over to Rich Condit because there are way too many authors for me to go through. Let's just do. <laughs> Wait, there's 28 authors and at least 19 institutions. Yes, 
So first author is Joel Alves, and there's no indication that there are co-first authors. Senior author is Francis Jiggins, um, and they're from everywhere. They're from the UK, they're from the US, they're from Portugal, they're from Australia. Um, I think that's all the countries involved. Johannesburg. Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. Yeah. It's wherever you have rabbits. Did you say did you say Denmark? <laughs> Denmark. Oh no, Miss Denmark. This no, is a Norway, huge, France. huge France. collaboration, and you're going to realize why in a minute. And our and buddy there, Grant McFadden's on the paper. That's right. And two people from his lab, uh, uh, Anna Lemus Damatos and Masmuder uh, Raman. So, yeah. So uh, this is. Did we say parallel adaptation of rabbit populations to yep. myxoma virus? So let's. Um, Review the story here. We've done this general story a couple of times on TWIV, but let's uh, uh, remind ourselves about it. First of all, we're talking about pox viruses. These are large DNA-containing viruses that have the unusual property of replicating in the cytoplasm of infected cells. And they are like, um, in the current context, I think they're like many giant viruses, <laughs> giant viruses that we talk about a lot are basically pox viruses that have accumulated a lot of baggage over the years. Um, and we're and the about most rabbit. notorious of the the most notorious of the pox viruses is smallpox. That's yeah. uh, a major motivation for uh, studying them over the decades. Uh, myxoma is a pox virus of rabbits, uh, and it is uh, it causes in um, rabbits in South America and North America, the species of rabbit there, when infected with myxoma, you get a fairly benign disease, maybe a few benign lesions, a fairly persistent infection, but it doesn't do much. But if you stick it in a different species of rabbit that you find in Europe, it totally, it kills them. It's a very so the, lethal disseminated disease. The American cottontail is Silvolagus species and the european rabbit is oryctolagus cuniculus and that's important because in the american rabbits this is a this is a minor thing that circulates all the time in the european rabbits this is uh this is fatal so they have a uh uh so the the basic story here is that uh rabbits were imported to australia uh in the mid 1800s, 1859 is the uh, date that they uh, yep. give. And, and, just and a, I, I, I tell my students, I think this is true that the, the Australian rabbits ran too fast, and these European ones ran slower. So I think they were easier <laughs> for the hunters. Well, they were certainly introduced for hunting. Some of the the guy who did it was landed gentry. He'd made his fortune in in Australia and. Um, decided he wanted some rabbits to hunt on his estate. So he imported two dozen rabbits from uh, Europe and released them on the estate. And, and it went very, time, very well from the yeah, rabbit's did, perspective. Did. You know, the rabbits went viral. Yes. <laughs> yeah. did. So there were millions in a very short period of time to the point where they became a real uh, agricultural pest. Yeah, this uh, was the and, fastest. and people wanted to get rid of them. <laughs> You might this say is the, our this farmers is the were fastest mad. known colonization of anything by a mammal species. Really? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, remember, it was Australia's in, a in, tabula risa. in a couple of decades, <laughs> they had spread across this entire vast continent and just went everywhere and ate everything. Right. Uh, and actually, this paper has uh, uh, some other history of the rabbit. That is interesting that I wanted that I wasn't aware of that we can uh, <laughs> uh, back up on, which is that the rabbit species we're talking about probably started in France um, and then made its way to the UK uh, 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 and then several hundred years ago, like 300 years ago, and then in uh, the 1850s was imported to Australia. And we'll, we'll come back to that. 
the rabbits had become enough of a pest in uh, Australia. They looked at several mm-hmm. different ways to try and control them and ultimately came up with the bright idea of infecting them with myxoma, which in this particular rabbit species causes a lethal infection. And so in 1952, they released uh, myxoma into the rabbit population and it wiped out 99.9% of them in just a couple of years. It was extraordinarily effective. Uh, however, but it's not um, perfectly effective, not perfectly effective. And, and remember, years, this, po- this population started with 24, so they don't need that many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and over the years, they came back. Yep. Um, and uh, what has happened is that the rabbits have become more resistant. And at least for a period of time, the virus became less virulent. Uh, and so you re- you re- reach a new equilibrium that at least was favorable enough for the rabbits so that the rabbits repopulated Australia to the point of being uh, quite a nuisance again. Uh, and uh, as a, not really a footnote, but another part of this is that in uh, 1995, there was actually a second effort at biological control using a different virus called rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, which is a different thing altogether. It's a Khaleesi virus, which is a small encapsulated RNA virus, uh, same general family as uh, noroviruses, um, but it causes in rabbits uh, a disease called necrotizing hepatitis that leads to fatal hemorrhages. Uh, gross. Uh, at any rate, um, this thing, it's interesting, the, uh, the story behind this. They decided they wanted to use this virus, and so they were doing tests on an island off the coast of Australia uh, to try and see if it would be useful. And the virus in 1995 escaped quarantine and uh, got to the uh, uh, mainland and killed 10 million rabbits within eight weeks of its release. Uh, so so that's uh, it did work, <laughs> but um, not for certain good definitions of work. Yeah, uh, the eradication efforts that went on in 1952 were also done uh, in France and the United Kingdom. Okay, so we have three different populations of rabbits uh, to deal with, and a lot of work has been done in looking at the viruses and how they've changed over time with this, and what virulence characteristics might have changed. And this is the first really uh, thorough look at the um, uh, genetic variation that has gone on in the rabbits. So the question, the fundamental question here is, what has the evolution in the rabbits been uh, over this entire uh, period of time to make them uh, more resistant? So let's see here. Uh, Let me me say one thing that, so this is a really interesting story because we know what virus was put in, we know when, we know the host, and, you know, we, we always talk about how spillovers of viruses from new hosts to other hosts leads to changes in the virus in the host, but we can, we can never pinpoint when it started. We don't have isolates from the beginning. You know, it's always hard, you know, if you, if you think about HIV going into people, you know, we don't have the original virus, you know, we don't know exactly when it went in, but here we know all of that. So it's a great artificial system to study. And I'm glad you uh, said artificial because they quote in the second paragraph of the introduction that this is considered, quote, one of the greatest natural experiments in evolution. <laughs> there is nothing natural. I don't think it is. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I caught that too, Kathy, and I, I, I agree with you completely. It's not natural. Um, so, and actually, uh, it's really important that they have three different populations of rabbits that they're looking at so that we can look and see whether the, and that they were all uh, treated with myxoma so that right. we so can there, look there and are see replicates of, There are replicates mm-hmm. of the experiment. Yes, they were all started exactly. around the same time. It's 1950 in Australia, 1952 in France, 1953 in the UK, introducing the virus into the same species of rabbits. Right, but the rabbits actually were established in the three different uh, geographical locations different at times. quite different times. Yes. They, uh, they uh, came initially from France, so they've been there forever. 
the suspicion is that they were introduced to the UK in the 13th century. And then, as we said before, uh, in uh, the mid 1800s uh, to Australia from the UK. So the way they approached this was to do what's called exome sequencing, uh, which is basically sequencing DNA that uh, correlates to the coding sequences uh, in all of the cells. And so the this way is you genome do this, sequencing on the cheap. <laughs> uh, yeah, because you're only talking about 1% really of the whole genome. Um, what, what you do is to uh, take genomic DNA, shear it into bits, and then use a hybridization protocol to oligonucleotides that replicate that represent the known coding capacity of the uh, genome to pull out of the fragmented DNA the bits that correlate to the uh, coding sequences, and then sequence those. So you're sequencing all the exons, which is why it's an exome. Right. So they sequenced uh, the exome from this is amazing, 152 rabbits from Australia, France, and the UK, and they sequenced what they call both historical samples and modern samples. Obviously, modern samples are fairly uh, recent. Historical samples, that's really interesting. These are samples that they got mostly from museums. They went around to museums from different places where they could document where these, uh, when these rabbits came uh, to the museum and what species and stuff they were, and they took samples of skin and bone. That's why they have two dozen authors. <laughs> That's, yeah, there a you lot go. of the authors are from uh, from museums, right? And uh, so they have roughly uh, equal numbers of historical and modern uh, uh, rabbits from, and equal numbers from uh, each of these sites. So it's a it's a good sample. Now, and they another got big part historical of the, samples going back to 1865. Yes, and one of the one of the big technical issues that enables this um, is that it is becoming more and more possible. I certainly won't say easier, but more and more possible to sequence DNA in worse and worse condition. Mm -hmm. And so, these museum samples, you've got something from the 19th century that somebody. Um, you know, skinned it and they dunked it in formaldehyde and then they, they mounted the skin and sent it back to their museum. And now you're going to go and try and extract some DNA from it. That is the DNA is a mess, but there are, there are more and more techniques available and there are even kits kits for some of this to, um, uh, to extract usable sequence from those kinds of samples. So the bottom line is we do have sequence information from rabbits uh, from three different geographical locations, both, both before and after they got trashed with uh, Mixoma. And we can compare them and find out what happened to the rabbits. They sequenced a lot did, of rabbits. Who yeah. did become, yeah, a lot of <laughs> rabbits, who did become resistant. Uh, the paper is loaded with um, statistical analysis of these data, which I personally am not competent to evaluate myself. Uh, they use two major things, one called principal component analysis, which as I look at it, identifies uh, groups or clusters of similar um, characteristics within a pool of genetic data. You can, you can, so, you can group things. Yes. So, so I'm prepared to look uh, to talk about this because I hear about it all the time in seminars in my department, and I finally wanted to know what's going on. And it's a type <laughs> of dimension reduction. So I want to explain that. So if you have a bunch of individuals and you measure their heights, you could plot them in a line like people do on a wall with kids or like Johnny has in her clinic. Okay, so that's a one-dimensional uh, depiction of the data for individuals – with one characteristic. If you had two characteristics, like their height and their weight, then you could plot that on a regular two-dimensional graph on the X and Y axis. If you have three dimensions, you could even do a kind of plot where you have the Z axis going sort of into the plane of the paper. But once you get four dimensions or four variables or above, you can't depict it in a two-dimensional way without doing some kind of dimensional reduction. And so uh, I picked 
two YouTubes as uh, part of my pick of the week. One's a five-minute one and one's about a 20-minute one. Uh, I think they're both really good. So heat maps are another way of doing dimension reduction, but doing principal component analysis, which is what they do here, is a very popular one. And yes, indeed, you end up with these clusters of dots, but it's mostly because you've picked the two components in the variables that have the most influence on grouping the data. Okay. And so... Um, so they're the principal components. That's right. Yeah. And the one that's on the x-axis is more important than the one that's on the y-axis. And so if things were equidistant, like say from near the origin out on the x-axis or near the origin up, and those distances were equal, the x-axis difference would be far more important. That's just the way they're plotted. So um, the, anyway, go ahead. The other statistical uh uh, item that they talk about that caught my attention is something called fixation index, which I don't know quite how it's calculated, but it looks uh, must look at frequencies of alleles over time. Um, and it, uh, uh, well, it's defined yeah, I, here as... I, yeah, I looked it up too. It's uh, the proportion of total variance in the subpopulation. So there, if you're looking at the Australia, UK, and France relative to the total variance in the total population. And yeah, there's a mathematical formula, but basically it ranges from zero to one. And if the value comes out zero, that means that they're interbreeding freely. And if it's close to one, it means that all of the genetic variation is explained by this population structure. Hmm. My, um, what I took away from this is that um, it identifies uh, changes that uh, are that are selected in the population over time. They're non-random in the population. Okay, that's how they identified. They used this quantity to identify uh, genes that were being selected out of the population uh, by the myxoma infection. At any rate, the main points uh, come out this way, as I see it, uh, first of all, that if you compare all these rabbits from the different locations, they are genetically different, okay? The principal component analysis uh, uh, can cluster the European rabbits together with the, uh, the, the European rabbits as, dis I'm sorry, the French rabbits as distinct right. from the uh, UK rabbits as distinct from the Australian rabbits. They are recognizably different. Which makes and, sense when you consider the founder effect that must have happened with the the 13th century transfer from French to the UK and then from the, especially the bottleneck from the UK to Australia with just two dozen individuals. Right. So if you just take a few rabbits and do this, you uh, are taking out of a very heterogeneous, presumably heterogeneous population, a few rabbits restricting the uh, gene pool when you do that transfer. And then that grows up. So you have something that is... Uh, distinct and those and it fits look, very nicely because the the distribution you see for the french rabbits is much bigger than the one for the uk rabbits and then the one for the australian rabbits is the smallest mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that makes sense mm -hmm. yes um and one of the things that they point out is that those clusterings uh contain both the historical rabbits and the modern rabbits and the conclusion from that is that the myxoma infection uh, did not really impose a serious bottleneck uh, on the uh, rabbits in those uh, populations. Right. And the way they explain that is, you know, if you start out with uh, 10 million rabbits and you kill 99.9% .9 of them, you still have a lot of rabbits. Uh, and so oh, yeah. if they grow, if they grow up again, uh, you not really, uh, it's not really a, a bottleneck. You, you maintain the gene pool that you started with. Right. The right? only way, the only way you'd create a bottleneck there is if you had somehow, um, you know, you eliminated only one tiny portion, uh, all but one specific portion, you know, and selected just in the initial elimination. Um, so the um, uh, fixation index analysis shows that some 
uh, genetic traits were in fact selected, if you like, by the Mixoma experience. They right. found uh, 193 single nucleotide polymorphisms, that is uh, genetic changes that they can monitor in 98 genes and in seven intergenic regions. Those are non-coding regions uh, that experience significant uh, changes uh, in frequency. Um, now, some of these are common to all three populations. So that implies that at least uh, with some genes, the same selection pressure on three different populations causes the same sort of response. So there are some genes that uh, help uh, regardless of uh, help deal with the virus, regardless of uh, the total genetic background or the ecology of the virus. But there are some that are uh, unique to each population. So the response of the French rabbits uh, in terms of the variation in their um, uh, genotype over time, uh, in some respects, was different than the rabbits in the UK, was different than the rabbits uh, in Australia. Uh, and they also found, uh, and I found this interesting, that all of the alleles that were selected out, you can find at some low level mm -hmm. frequency uh, in all of these populations in the historical rabbits. Uh, and so what they say here is that, you know, these rabbits have been fighting off infections since day one. Uh, and so there's a certain level of uh, experience uh, in their in their genomes with this kind of thing. And they have some alleles around that uh, might have been useful at one time or another for fighting one sort of infection or another. So they've been experimenting with pathogens their whole life. So when Mixoma comes around, they've already uh, developed some tools that they can now bring out front and amplify. Yeah, that's why they say it happened so quickly because they were there right. already, right? Right. So you're you're watching parallel evolution uh, happening on a historical scale and it's proceeding exactly as the textbooks say <laughs> parallel evolution in a selected trait is supposed to where you have um, these three different populations they used some common features to adapt to this new stress the myxoma virus and also their own diverse approaches based on their own populations and it was all selected from pre-existing diversity within each of these three pools. So the selected traits um, include uh, immune response, innate immune response effectors, uh, regulators of immunity, major histocompatibility complex uh, genes. Um, they give a, a list of uh, genes include, most don't, wouldn't, mean much to most listeners except uh, interferon alpha, but homologs of CD96, FCRL, CD200R, all of which play a regulatory role in the innate immune response, including effects on lymphocyte proliferation and, and activation. So as you might expect, but it's great to see, uh, the genes that are selected out have to do with the immune response uh, to the virus. Uh, interestingly, as sort of an aside, the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus infection, if I understood it correctly, uh, at least so far, has not revealed any, there's been no selection that they can see that's unique to that event. So I don't quite understand why that would be. Yeah. I was wondering if maybe it was just too soon. But, but I mean, maybe. there's clearly... Clearly, the viruses have the, the rabbits have adapted, and or the virus has adapted, and the rabbits are coming back. Uh, Actually, I don't know if the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus has persisted in the population. So I don't know if that was no. just a single event, or I if thought it stuck around, but maybe I don't. Maybe know. I mixed it up. I don't know. Certainly in the case of myxoma, you have constant pressure. You've got right. a, a pathogen host thing that's going on in time. Um, I don't know about the uh, RHDV. Maybe somebody will write in and tell us. How's that spread? Is that also insect or is that rabbit to rabbit? Uh, I do not know. Because that might make a difference, right? That might. I do not know. Um, 
So they did uh, one experiment to okay. So the high the the idea would be that it's still for example, okay. Rh just a just a quick note here before we get past it. RHDV is still being isolated has still been isolated from rabbits in Sydney as of 2014, according to this veterinary um, page, and they're planning on releasing another variant. Okay. Uh, they just want to get rid of these rabbits, don't they? Yeah, well, yeah. Are the, they still a pest today? Oh, yeah. Of course. I think so. Mm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But there's so much room in Australia. Leave them alone. Mm. Well, but there's, <laughs> it's full of rabbits. <laughs> They've filled it all up. <laughs> you know, I went to Melbourne. I didn't see a single rabbit. Oh, well, I spent six months there, and I didn't either, but it, except in the marketplace. But if you go outside, you can see them all over the place. Yeah, where there's They're no the people, outback. right? Where there are no They're people. The yeah, where there's no people. Yeah, there's no and people. RHDV. And there's no predators. The really big issue is that there are no predators. Well, Dingo dogs are not fast enough to catch them. Use predators, right? Because that would go so well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what do you want this to do? True. Put some lions or tigers in there? Sure, what kind of predator? Uh, so coyotes would be fine. Apparently, um, <laughs> or, apparently or, or, transmitted or birds, direct predator. contact. Direct contact. So maybe that is... is could make a difference. Make a difference. There are some birds of prey, but not too many. Not too many. I mean, they that's why they have venomous species. Oh yeah, but they're. You know, but they don't hunt rabbits. They don't hunt rabbits. They do not. So they you do. Uh, they do one experiment to um, uh, support the notion that these genetic changes actually uh, uh, make a difference in the response to the virus. They um, select out. Uh, an allele that is selected, they, they choose an allele that was selected for the interferon alpha gene. Okay. So the, uh, interferon is a, uh, innate immune response gene that will, that, that could be implicated in, uh, in resistance, uh, to infection. And they take a, uh, uh, the original interferon gene and the evolved interferon gene, and they actually express them and make the protein and uh, uh, treat virus-infected uh, cells in culture uh, with uh, those interferons to see if they work differently. Uh, and they find out that um, uh, the evolved interferon preferentially inhibits the uh, modern attenuated myxoma. Therefore, as they, in, to quote them, natural selection has increased the potency of the interferon response in modern rabbit populations that have co-evolved with myxoma. Uh, so that's a biochemical support for their conclusion that these genes that have been selected actually do confer uh, resistance. Uh, so one of the... I like what this is, this proviral gene. Their idea there that some of those have decreased in their ability to support virus replication. Right, right. that's yeah. cool. So there's um, so there's some cellular genes that are needed for replication, and they have changes in them which they speculate may be reduce viral replication. So it's the opposite of a an immune response gene. Uh, and so summarizing all of this, they say genetic resistance to myxomatosis is a polygenic trait. So there are many genes involved resulting from the cumulative effect of multiple alleles shifting in frequency across the genome. So there's not, not just a few major effect changes, but a more subtle, uh, many gene, uh, effect. That's it. Yeah, and I th yeah. one one thing in leading from that, they conclude that because this is a multigenic or polygenic effect, you're going to get a quantitative increase in resistance. You're never going to eliminate the virus. There will always be some virus, and they say that will select for more virulent viruses. And as you mentioned earlier, that's actually what has happened. Mm -hmm. And those more virulent viruses, which are which are more recent, have immunosuppressive properties, which makes sense considering how the rabbits have evolved, right? Well, the interesting thing is that I've always wondered about is that uh, so you're you, you keep you've established essentially a new equilibrium. That's it's a dynamic e equilibrium. It keeps changing because the rabbits keep changing and the virus keeps changing. But from the human perspective, there's still too many damn rabbits. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> why why what what is it in all of this that 
um, settles out at a certain density of rabbits and a certain density of virus. I don't understand that. So, Rich, there's a wonderful book written by Andrew Artha and Birch. They're population uh, ecologists, and they wrote a lot about all of what you're just talking about. So if mm -hmm. you wanted to really get an insight into the way populations behave uh, with predator-prey relationships, for instance, when you take away the predator, you get this. And, and this is a, a, a nightmare for any natural uh, population. They did that in Yellowstone Park and the elk nearly extinct and all the other species in the park by overgrazing. Mm -hmm. Reintroduction of wolves solved the problem. But you're going to get an equilibrium. There's no question. Um, there's an island off the coast of um, Michigan. Um, not Michigan, but um, Minnesota. Isle Royal, where, where when the lake was frozen, a pack of wolves chased about five or ten moose across the ice onto the island. And then the island, uh, and the ice melted and stranded the wolves and the, and the moose. It's mm -hmm. the longest studied introduction of predator prey relationship that we know of uh, with regards to mammals and uh that thing had so many ups and downs over the years it was incredible and they could tell you exactly how many moose exactly how many wolves and and, and all of a sudden a disease swept through the moose the wolves starved because there was no more to, nothing more to eat the remaining moose recovered <laughs> overpopulated because there weren't enough wolves it was a nightmare it was an absolute hmm. nightmare so <laughs> All of this stuff goes right back to the establishment of, um, you know, ecology, basically. This is an ecological study uh, that's really quite uh, fascinating. Then they built well, this gigantic fence all the way across Australia to keep them out of a certain area, right? And I that, actually that didn't worked. work, did it? That no. didn't well, work. Well, it worked a little yeah. bit. Well, it, it worked a little it, bit. It worked a little bit, but the problem was the fence was too long and they couldn't maintain it. Um, exactly. So the the reason you would end up with myxoma, which is mosquito-borne, um, you would get to a population of rabbits that could no longer sustain transmission when you get below a critical mass. There just aren't enough rabbits getting exactly. bitten by mosquitoes that then yeah, bite some other right. species. Um, so there's a there's a transmission chain that has to happen mm -hmm. for this virus. Yeah. So apparently, we never got below that in, <laughs> no. in Australia, right? Yeah. No, we didn't. We didn't lose either the virus or the rabbits. And they tried hunting as well, right? Oh, yep. they boy, did they try hunting! <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> there Heck, there are pictures of, of, of truckloads, <laughs> literal truckloads of rabbits exactly. just piled all the way up, you know, loading down yeah. a truck, taking it off to market. And um, you just you can't shoot them fast enough. And just to put a coda on this, we talked about this story not too long ago. Right. They, tr you know, they, they have a carp issue in Australia. They escaped the <laughs> yes. farms and they got into the rivers and now they want to put a herpes virus in to kill the carp, and they're trying to figure out how to deal with the millions of pounds of fish that are going to be floating in the rivers and how to get rid of them and so forth. But oh, it's a mess. I don't it's get it with Australia and the, this huh. control. They're, they're kind of like Florida writ large, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. That's a cool story. Thank you, Rich. Well, it's a, it's, it's a great chapter. It is. In a long ongoing story that it's ser ongoing will serve story. as a right. <laughs> serve as a model forever about the uh, coevolution of viruses and their hosts, and this is a this is a critical piece of information that's been missing, and a massive study to figure it out. Now we know how the rabbits are really responding. All right, let's do uh, what do we got here? Three forty. No, but we had 50, we had a twenty minute delay, right? About 15. 15. So let's do a couple of emails. A couple of emails, maybe. We have uh, an email from Justin who sends a link to a Science Magazine article. Vaccine opponents attack U.S. science panel. U.S. Uh. anti-vax movement has found a new front for its attacks on scientists and their work. Gatherings of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Uh, so, yeah, so these um, individuals went to these meetings and started screaming that they basically don't want to be told what vaccines to take. How is it a vaccine that caused my son's intestine to fold in on itself and almost die safe and effective? Um, I don't think a vaccine did that. Well, there was a, there was an issue with a, <clears throat> um, a rotavirus, rotavirus vaccine it, that was approved that caused into susception. Well, the new one doesn't uh, do that anymore. The new one doesn't do that, but <clears throat> it's possible that somebody, you know, came to the meeting who had had a kid injured by that vaccine. Mm -hmm. and, 
And yeah, that was an approval that, um, you know, and uh, it made sense initially and then it got out to market and it was discovered that there was this complication that was rare enough that it didn't show up in the clinical trials. And so it was pulled from the market. Uh, there's uh, even, I think, continuing debate on whether or not that was a statistically significant yes. Yes. Uh, problem <laughs> because the virus itself can cause intussusception. That's yes. Right. That's right. Uh, and, yes. Harry Greenberg, who was involved in the production of that vaccine will that's what he says it's not clear that there really was an but increase. that highlights the abundance of caution with which we approach these things something like that shows up you pull the vaccine off the market and if you can't be certain that it didn't cause that then it stays off the market yeah and so now and now we have a better rotavirus vaccine that has not had that problem and has been given to millions of kids and prevents a childhood infection that can cause a serious problem and is saving lives around the world Right. At any rate, this is uh, just a, one more example of the really uh, aggressive and I think increasingly irrational tactics of the yes. uh, anti-vax group. That's really annoying. Really. Uh, annoying. The next one's from David. Dear Twiv stars, I was just listening to Twiv five three seven. Yet another great episode, and had to laugh about Dixon's bat on a stick bush meat propaganda. I wrote in because. I actually once came by a street vendor selling fried bats in Batambang, Cambodia, in a very pleasant city to stroll in or visit. I must admit that even for local Khmer people who do not shy away from fried tarantulas or ant soup, not to mention fermented fish, this was a step too far, and the vendor did not seem to have a thriving business. However, <laughs> hunger can do a lot to people. Another thing is the ongoing massacre of the name Leuvenhoek, that's the way I say it these days. Originally from Belgium. I, you know, you taught me, Dixon. I did. So I used to say Lewenowek, right? Yeah. <laughs> and someone had it's told me that. Hook. Someone had told me that. And it was in a lecture that, that's recorded. You can go find. And then Dixon said, no, no, no. It's Lewenhoek. And, um, and my, you know, Hopi Hookstra, who I did a Twivo with, she said, yeah, Hookstra is the way you pronounce her name. And Leuven Hook would be the way you say his name. So that's what he, right. he said. Anyway, as, to continue from David, originally from Belgium, Flemish Dutch speaking part, I only later came to realize that Dutch has much more sounds than any other European languages and tricky ones for that. <clears throat> Kudos for Dixon, who came pretty close, although everyone doubted whether that was how it was supposed to be. All right, Dixon, how do you say it? Leuven Hook. Leuven Hook, yeah. I, I don't think I doubted that that was, that sounds No, I right. think I did. I, he's okay. he's going to talk about me in the next several sentences, and I take full <laughs> responsibility for that. It's I fine. suspect he has been practicing the name with Dutch speakers over a dinner while he was visiting. In any case, it should not. This is not, true. This is absolutely true. That's, that's how I learned how to pronounce it. In any case, it should not be a Germanized version like, what's that, Kathy? I said it more like Leuvenhoek, and he didn't like that. Leuvenhoek. That was uttered by some of the otherwise very noble and esteemed professors. That's you, right. Kathy? The noble yeah. and esteemed professor? No, no, it's the Germanized version. I don't claim noble <laughs> and esteemed. <laughs> While I am not entirely convinced by the Google Translate pronunciation, it may serve as a general <laughs> guideline. Sorry for the pedantry, but I thought you might want to solve the riddle. <laughs> Best regards <laughs> from a hot and windy Hinotepe, Nicaragua, David. Leuven Hook. We love. And I, uh, I have a, a little link to a video, by the way, that I saw this letter and I searched up this video. You can go to this, and they have clips of YouTube videos of English speakers pronouncing Leuvenhoek in <laughs> all sorts of different ways. And it just goes to the clip of somebody saying, you know, and then Leuvenhoek, and then Leuvenhoek, and then Leuvenhoek did. Yeah. So we've it's decided but, it's but Leuvenhoek. I love, I Leuvenhoek. love Vincent Leuvenhoek. Lewenowick, yes. Yeah, I've it's never good. heard that it's one. good. I don't know where I got that from, but I, I said it in a lecture. And then just today I, I noted on one of my YouTube lecture videos, someone said, I've, I've just re-listened. I listened a few years ago. And he said, I'm really sorry that you corrected the way you said Leuvenhoek. I really like the old way. <laughs> 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 but it's not right. <laughs> Leuvenhoek. Leuvenhoek. Let's see, Hoekstra. Hopi Hoekstra. She said, I pronounced that properly, Hookstra. And she said, you would say Leuvenhoek. Yep. Is that right, Dixon? It is. Good. Now, um, Rich, are you there? I'm there. Can you take the series of Anthony emails? Okay. 
So Anthony uh, writes one of his uh, typically, you know, he's got a, a list of basically snippets here. <laughs> one is a YouTube video to a recording of Happy Days Are Here Again. And I don't really understand what the relevance of that is. It's got FDR. It's got FDR. It's got JFK. It's got um, uh, Obama. So there may be a political message in that. I'm not sure. Then he says, anti-vaxxers have said some pretty dumb things throughout the year, but these 15 are off the charts. One is, and he must have had a, a link or something that's missing to the 15, but one is, if vaccines are so great, why aren't they mentioned in the Bible? <laughs> that's the new, the new Testament, not the Old Testament. <laughs> How many people does it take to write a number one hit? In the case of Travis Scott's smash sicko mode, which came out August 3rd, 2018, it has been on the Billboard's Hot 100 chart every week since. 30 different songwriters are credited. That's Lord. pretty weird. Uh, another topic. In science papers with similarly top-heavy pedigree, same most contributors... Same topic, yeah. <laughs> oh, same topic. I'm sorry. In science papers with similarly top... Ah, similarly top-heavy pedigree, most contributors are also a dab of this and a pinch of that. How many papers are produced really by teams like the building of a house, a film production, or an orchestra performance? Is there a training for someone to be project manager or conductor <laughs> for science papers? That's a really good question. If actually. you give a museum skin, you get on the paper, right, Alan? <laughs> yes, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, and there's no set of rules, and there's certainly no training for being. Well, everybody on that uh, paper a had project some skin in the game. You had some skin in the game. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, uh, I don't the, know. I don't know what this song is. Does anyone know this? This uh, sicko I never, mode. I had not heard this. Never I've got a 13 year old in the house. I'm supposed to be up on friends, but I sorry. I don't. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, then he's got a link to. Oh yes, an ABC News uh, article on the. Uh, spread of MERS in Saudi Arabia that what's interesting uh, about it, among other things, is a camera at an airport that's an infrared sensor that basically scans people coming through to determine whether any of them uh, have an abnormally high body temperature. Right. And he says, I've not known about this. I've not been near an airport for nearly 10 years. Perhaps these uh, ca uh, cameras are common there. I had well, heard about this. Well, I have it in my lecture notes that when the SARS epidemic started, that that's when they first started using those thermosensing yeah. cameras. That's right. That's right. By the way, Rich, that's Arab news, not ABC news. Yes, that's right. Oh, I'm sorry. Arab <laughs> news. <laughs> All right. Uh, should we do one more? Sure. Uh, sure. Alan, you want to take that last one? Uh, Connor writes, Dear Twift team, I've been listening to you all for about four years now since my second year of undergrad. You all have been with me through community college, my first PCRs, to now as I listen while writing my MS thesis. I'm getting in touch because I find myself at a crossroads and I'm not sure which way to turn. I have been in a great, very productive, unique research lab for the past three years, working on a topic I find incredibly interesting. The core focus of the lab is not my discipline. It's an engineering lab while I'm a biochemist, but they've let me design my own interdisciplinary projects to get, to get at really novel, exciting science. I was originally planning on applying for PhD programs now in the next year, but the lab I've been in just asked me to stay with them for a PhD. I would have opportunities to apply for funding for projects based on experiments I designed, and I would be set to graduate in three to four years. The science is really exciting and hard to walk away from, but I don't know if I should stay. Setting aside that staying at the same lab for undergrad and graduate school is generally looked down upon, I have only worked on one topic for the past four years when there's a world of science out there. I listen to these podcasts, and every week I hear something new that I find really exciting. Then again, I also read horror stories of ill-tempered PIs and toxic work environments. I know my current lab is nothing like that. I guess the bottom line is, do I stick with what I know, a great research environment, great science, and great opportunities, or do I continue to explore the science that's out there? <laughs> I apologize for meandering and the butchering of commas. I hadn't noticed. Uh, it's just thesis fever. All advice is appreciated. I respect your collective opinions very much. And Connor's in Virginia. Um, well, first of all, I would say that, as Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Um, but, uh, uh, for the, for the question of should you stay or should you go? Um, I don't know that it's really looked down upon 
that you stay in the same place for undergrad and graduate work. Uh, I mean, you've already stayed there through the master's degree, and it sounds like you're in a great place and doing cool stuff. And I would just add that you should bear in mind that if you go to a PhD program, you're going to have to come up to speed on some new thing um, and possibly, you know, take a couple of additional years to rotate through labs or whatever their procedure is before you really get tucked into a project. Um, I, d- I don't know about walking away from a situation like this. This actually sounds like a pretty good deal. I think I, I think I agree, Alan. I, you do, you do hear people, uh, talk about how you should move around and that at least the implication is that you shouldn't stay for multiple degrees in uh, one institution, but there's no hard or fast rule. And I, I don't think I ever, I never looked down on it. What, you, you would find people who'd say that. And then the, at the, in the, in the next breath, they'd go about trying to recruit people from their own institution into their uh, right. graduate programs. That's true. I think okay, I so, remember, yeah, I remember Michael Gale saying that that whole thing is overrated and there's no problem with staying in the same area for a while. Yeah. Cause I think Michael Gale's been where he is forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now the, the place where you, you probably do want to change is PhD to postdoc. Yeah. If you, if you can, if, but if, you, yeah, if, that, if it you makes know, sense. Yeah. What I think is key here is that he says the science is really exciting and hard to walk away from. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, it. Exactly. Totally. Yeah, me too. Me too. That's that what, trumps everything, right? Yeah. yeah. I hate yeah. to use yeah, that word. Right. Yeah. Um, I, we constantly say, do what you love. Yep. If he's excited. He, he's, he's into it. T- totally trumps everything else. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Right. Stay where you are. Love the one you're with. That's, uh, so this is a thesis fever. Is that like a play on something else? What is it? I don't know. What, what's the basketball thing? March fever? March, March fever. madness. March madness. Okay. March madness. Okay. Got yeah. it. All right. Picks of the week. Alan, what do you have for us? This is a nerdy pick more than a science pick, but come on. This is just, this place is a blast. <laughs> uh, finally got around to going here a few weeks ago. Uh, one Saturday morning, we didn't have anything else to do. And I, I said to my daughter, so you want to go eat sugary cereal and play video games? And she looked at me like, who the heck are you and what have you done with my dad? <laughs> right. um, and uh, this is a place that if you're if you're Gen X or uh, really anybody, but especially my generation, uh, and you're anywhere near Western Massachusetts, go to the quarters in Hadley. They have the it's <laughs> it's kind of set up like a bar, but the walls are completely lined with old video game cabinet <laughs> machines. <laughs> And everything from Dig Dug and Cubert to Gauntlet and Space Invaders and and you just go in and uh, wow. on Saturdays they do this thing where you pay one cover charge and you get unlimited tokens for the machines and unlimited um, uh, cereal. They have breakfast cereals lined up and they show uh, Saturday morning cartoons <laughs> from the eighties and it's just it is a blast. Wow, cool, cool. All so right. go there and nerd out. <laughs> Rich, what do you have? Well, I got all worked up about Bohemian Rhapsody. And uh, uh, as many people may know, that their lead guitarist, Brian May, is also an astrophysicist. He was in graduate school studying astrophysics when Queen uh, hit the big time. And so he put that aside for, I don't know, 20, 30 years or something like that. But uh, after Freddie Mercury died and Queen uh, sort of... uh, uh, backed off. He uh, resumed his uh, work, his uh, studies, and got a PhD in astrophysics. And uh, he's a chancellor of a university in, uh, in in the UK, and even has an asteroid named after him. And so he wrote a uh, music uh, video. He wrote music, and they recorded a video that is a tribute to the New Horizons space probe that recently. <laughs> Um, examined um, a uh, an element in the Cooper's belt, the Ultima Thule, which is this small biome. It looks like a Gemini virus. Okay. <laughs> At any rate, they have an animation of the uh, New Horizons probe with music written by uh, Brian May. Have a look. Nice. All right, Dixon. What do you have? Uh, mine's an article from the National Geographic magazine on rats. Um, I've, I'm particularly fascinated by uh, urban ecology, as I, I think all of us that live in a city are, because you're amazed at all the wildlife that you see, uh, you know, red-tailed hawks and squirrels and 
Uh, in this case, rats. <laughs> and it's an inescapable part of city life, it claims. Wherever you go around the world, as long as you're in a large, densely populated area, there will be rats. So it, of course, raises the question, how come there are, more, are, are not more outbreaks of plague, for instance, or some other rat-borne viral disease? Or, um, you know, there are lots of other hmm. diseases that rats can transmit, but uh, they don't seem to be causing the biggest as big a problem as their populations indicate should be there. So I mean, perhaps they lead a, an isolated life. They live, you know, in the rabbit warrens and little holes in the walls and the subways and stuff like this. But we've all seen them skipping across the road at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, don't ask me what I was doing out there at three o'clock in the morning, but I did see one do that. And you're always repelled and repulsed by that. And you, you, know, you go to some place like, New Delhi, not New Delhi, but Old Delhi in India, and you can, you know, the place is just crawling with them. And there are rat collectors, and there are rat adorers, people that love rats, people that keep them as pets. You know, I, <laughs> I've killed enough rats in my life just because I was a, a parasitologist working with them all the time that <clears throat> I, I actually liked rats. I thought the rats that I dealt with, the white rats that I dealt with, the Wistars or very tame animals compared to the wild ones. But this is a fascinating article. One thing I'm curious about, I heard a great talk about 20 years ago by somebody who claimed to be a, an expert on rats from Washington, D.C., that claimed that rats actually are cockroach eaters. They don't eat garbage. They wait for the cockroaches to eat the garbage, and then they eat the cockroaches. This article doesn't address that issue. and in They fact, eat garbage. They do eat, of course they, they do when it's available. <laughs> they do, but they don't want to go out and take risks because there are lots of other things out there's there. There's a like picture feral. in this, there's a picture right in this article of them. It looks like no, pulling I mean, a pizza crust out yeah. of a trash yeah, of course. can. Yep. Of course. For, for sure. Of course. Dixon, you like rats because you were bitten by one years ago. I was, that's true. I was. And it injected, it's so like you're the Spider-Man of rats. You're Rat-Man. <laughs> <Warfare>. and, <laughs> when the moon is full, yeah. <laughs> Well, I do have to trim my whiskers more often than most, so maybe that's that accounts for that. Huh. What they really need to do, the rats really need to do, is grow bushy tails. You know, they're <laughs> squirrels, and nobody cares. I don't this get it. This is true. This is this is really true. But again, why so many rats? No predators. Oh, let's release some predators in Manhattan, Dixon. Yeah. What do you think? How about a viral? How about a, some a lethal rat infection? Come on. Actually, one year on the final exam for my virology course, I said, you know, there's a an epidemic of rats in New York. The mayor suggests we release a virus. Explain whether this is a good idea or not. <laughs> right. And you can go back to the myxomatosis story. Yeah, exactly. Find out what that's going <laughs> to Maybe I'll revive that. Oh, I think you should. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? Well, uh, I have the two videos about principal component analysis that I mentioned earlier. and ah, uh, right. But I already had something picked that I want to keep. And that's a paper in the Open Access Journal of Viruses called Educational Material About Influenza Viruses. And the authors are uh, Seema Lakdawala and, let's see, uh, I have too many tabs open, uh, Nana Nair and Edward Hutchinson. And it's a cool paper it, that's part of a whole special issue in the viruses uh, about influenza, but this was different because uh, she also has they ha have a primary research article in the paper but in the issue but this has a series of things for education at several different levels so a fact page a page to color the virus a word find puzzle and the the word find is based on a review article from Adam Loring's lab and then there's uh, the coloring page is based on structure from Ed Hutchinson and then there's a connect the dots uh, thing that's really cool that I love because it taught me that the, the research that's described in another paper in Nucleic Acids Research Plus in this issue that shows that how we think or ha maybe have thought about nucleoprotein binding to viral RNA for influenza is now different based on work from CMS lab. And so you connect the dots and you see that some parts of the viral RNA are exposed and that makes opportunities for them to perhaps interact with other segments for packaging or all kinds of things. So I, I think it's a cool mixture of science and science communication. 
and it's open access, so I wanted people to see it. We did that paper on TWIV, by the way. I think you weren't here, but that was her first paper, and she was so excited that we talked about it on TWIV. Oh, I do remember that. And now yeah. it's yes. going to be in the textbook, because our next edition, we're modifying cool. the NP oh, picture nice. based on yeah. that. How about that? Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I always tell people, you got to communicate, and here's another way. <laughs> Do something like this. Mm-hmm. Whatever works. My pick is an article in Ars Technica by Beth Moll, who does the microbiology writing for them. Why chicken pox parties are a terrible idea in case it's not obvious. Okay, if you need to sh- sh- put this in someone's face, because there's this guy in Kentucky, he let all of his kids get chicken pox instead of vaccine. Yes. Matt Governor Matt Bevan made headlines Tuesday after revealing in a radio interview that he had purposefully exposed his nine unvaccinated children to chickenpox. And he said, yeah, they got a little sick, but they're okay. Come yeah. on. You're an idiot. What if one of them had died? How would you have felt? Yeah. All right. So this is uh, all about chickenpox, why it's not a good idea. And uh, then shingles and so forth. And the vaccines are wonderful. And uh, you should not expose your your kids to chicken pox. This is crazy. All right. So if you want to send someone an article, you can send them this. I wish I'd gotten the chicken pox vaccine. It didn't exist when I was a kid. Now, you know, I've got to get a shingles vaccine at some point to prevent that. Tell me about it. Yeah, I didn't have it wasn't available. I got chicken pox like every Mm -hmm. other kid. And then it sucked around episode eight of TWIV. I got shingles. Mm. (laughs) And I remember because. I think episode eight was with Saul Silverstein on herpes viruses, and we talked about it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Right. Although we didn't show it because it's a podcast. Yes. All right, TWIV 540. Where you can find TWIV is, well, if you want to see the show notes, you know, we, we talk about things and we put links, the letters, et cetera. That's at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Most of you listen on your phone or tablet. You never even get near the website. That's okay. But if you do, please subscribe. We like to see the numbers or as we say here, the numbers. The numbers. And Got a problem um, with that? I have no problem. <laughs> you know, somewhere, oh, this is pretty funny. Someone sent a letter to Twim, and they said, Michelle Swanson has a wonderful voice. She could definitely <laughs> record audio books one day. Vincent, you're, you could also record audio books, but only about Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> now... We were not supposed to mention Woody Allen anymore. Yeah. But um, is my accent that strong? I guess. I guess it is. And it's not that strong, but it is It is noticeable enough that you could definitely do, a, yeah. You could, you could do a New Yorker. Where was I? So, oh, yes, on your tablet or smartphone, please um, subscribe and send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. And as I said earlier, if you really like us, consider supporting us financially. It pays for our expenses. can allow us to do shows elsewhere. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Give a buck a month. You know, if all of you listening did that, we could, we could do a lot. And uh, Dixon de Palmier, he, he's usually right here in front of me. But um, now he's over in New Jersey, and you if can you turn f- your chair around; he'll be in front of you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> then, you, then I will be off mic. That's not yeah. good. <laughs> you can find him at trichinella.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. I'm glad the Skype is working. Absolutely. Sound good. Me too. Yeah, it's fun. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit, an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas, although today he's coming from eastern Massachusetts. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Well, you're going to be for a bit, right? Uh, I'm here for another about mm, three or four days. I leave on Tuesday, but I'm going to Florida to go sailing. And I'll be there for a week, and then I'm going home. Itinerant. Emeritus virologist. Right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna podcast from the sailboat. I will actually be on the water <laughs> for okay. the next podcast. All right. All right. The next so next Friday you're not gonna be with us. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Alan Dove's at turbidplaque.com and he's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Rackinello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV, the American Society for Virology, and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology 
Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>